Story number one. I want to share something that happened to me recently. My name is Alexandra. I am 25 years old and I am studying at the third year of university. I have a boyfriend, Victor. We live together. We rent an apartment. Sometimes he does not come at night and because of this, we often quarrel. A little about myself. I take care of my body. Nothing superfluous, in my opinion, and in my boyfriend's opinion, there is nothing superfluous in me. I regularly do sports. I am 170 km tall, brunette, slender legs. And when I wear high heels, so in general, all passing men look only at me, especially if I'm in a miniskirt. I used to dress stylishly, brightly and tastefully. It was Saturday, a day off. Victor, leaving in the evening, told me that he was going out late again with his friends. That meant I didn't have to wait for him in the evening. Sometimes he invited me along, and one day I accepted. I won't go into details. I'll just say that I never had such a boring evening in my life again. From then on, I hung out with my girlfriends, and he hung out with his friends. After he left, I decided to clean up the apartment a bit and then call my girlfriend and invite her over to my place so I wouldn't be bored alone. But my plans were not destined to come true. The doorbell rang and I went to open it. When I saw a very fat man in his 50s, I recognized him as Jake, Victor's father. I wondered why Victor hadn't told me he was coming. I opened the door and let him in. Hi, Alexandra. I was driving by and thought I'd stop by. Are you alone? Where's Victor? He asked, crossing the threshold. Hi. He's not here right now. He's out with his friends again, I complained. It was a shame. I wanted to have a serious talk with him, Jake said, then added, How could he leave a girl like that alone? I blushed a little, but I was grateful for the compliment. He didn't seem surprised that his son wasn't home, though. On the contrary, he started to take off his jacket and shoes. I told him again that Victor was not at home. That's okay. I'll tell him what I want to say through you, he replied, smiling. It seemed to me that he was a little drunk. I was surprised, of course, but there was nothing left for me to do but to escort him into the room. He sat down on the couch, and I went to the kitchen to make tea. As I left the room, I looked back and saw Jake looking at me, or rather, my ass. He was openly staring, and I felt awkward, very awkward. In the kitchen, I thought about it and decided I just imagined it. Putting the mugs on the tray, I went into the room. As soon as I entered, I was immediately shocked by what I saw. The tray immediately slipped out of my hands and everything ended up on the floor. One mug was shattered. That was the impression I got from what was happening in the room. What I saw was this. Jake was sitting on the couch, his pants lying to the side. I froze like that. For about 10 seconds, I couldn't even move. What are you doing? I yelled. Go away now. No, I can't leave, he said. And it wasn't that I was uncomfortable. It had been like that all night. It was hard to imagine that it could happen. Early in the morning, he left. I liked it too, I said and closed the door behind him. We'd agreed not to say anything to Victor, and Jake had forgotten why he'd come. A few days later, his father came to our apartment again, met by Victor, who hugged him and said he was glad to see him. He looked at me with a smile, and I blushed. I was so afraid he was going to tell Victor about that night. I offered to have tea. Make us some tea, sweetie, and I'll talk to my father, Victor said, and I went into the kitchen. The thought of the secret coming out made me very nervous, and at the same time it excited me a lot. I brought tea and cake, and we sat down to drink. Jake kept his eyes on my slender legs and licked his lips a lot. Victor said that he had to leave for half an hour, and that he was leaving me in the company of his father. Just as I closed the door, his father jumped on me, took me in his arms, and put me on the bed, and it happened again. A mad passion filled us. I lay there exhausted, but I remembered that Victor was coming, so I quickly got dressed, brushed my hair, and went to the bathroom. 
and his father put on his pants and just left. What am I supposed to do now? Should I confront my boyfriend's father again? Should I tell Victor what happened? I have so many questions and no answers. Story number two. The story of my life happened thanks to my mother-in-law's desire to spend a summer vacation at the sea. My father-in-law, John, did not agree to such a pastime. So Mary took along her adored son, who was also my husband. In general, I regretted my decision to marry Michael three months after the wedding. Despite the fact that we lived separately, my mother-in-law managed to ruin my marriage in the most qualitative way. My aunt constantly interfered in our lives, turned Michael against me, tried to count our money. I seriously began to think about divorce, so their departure became for me a real salvation and a full-fledged vacation. This paradisiacal life lasted only six days. In the evening, Michael called me in tears and snot, informing me that my mother Ruth was seriously ill. She urgently needed to return to her hometown for treatment because the local doctors do not want to deal with her health. But there are no tickets for airplanes, buses, or trains. It is a pity that they are unavailable in high season. A little later, my father-in-law, James, called. I didn't hear panic in his voice. Apparently, the man realized that nothing terrible had happened to his wife. In any case, he was going to go to his beloved for the weekend and called me with him. Firstly, it would be more fun on the road together. And secondly, I could at least swim in the sea. There was nothing to keep me at home, so I gladly accepted. Uncle James was a jolly fellow. He was the only one I continued to like in the Adams family. He never got in the way of advice or pretenses, stood by me when my wife attacked me and helped around the house. Michael, it seemed to me, had never picked up a hammer and screwdriver in his life, preferring to leave all the work to his father. The trip seemed fun only for the first half of the day and then fatigue set in. And in the evening, we almost had an accident. Uncle James managed to dodge a dump truck and stay on the road. After that, we decided to spend the night in a neighboring town. To relieve the stress, we went to a cafe, ate some hot food, and had a few drinks. In the hotel, we went to our rooms. I took a shower and fell on the bed, intending to surf the internet. There was a knock on the door, and I opened it. Uncle James was standing on the doorstep, looking for a manicure file. The accessory was in my bag. While I pulled it out, Uncle James studied my figure. I hadn't brought my puritanical robe, so I was wearing only a tight top and a not-so-subtle bottom. In principle, I didn't mind the inspection. The man's attention flattered me. So when he slowly closed the door and approached, I didn't play hard to get. After all, our halves deserved what they got. I woke up the next morning with a mixture of emotions, satisfaction at my revenge, but also regret and worry. Uncle James was already up. We didn't discuss what had happened. We continued the drive to pick up his wife, Mary, and my husband, Michael. The atmosphere in the car was tense and awkward. When we arrived in the seaside town, the truth about Mary's illness became apparent. She had fabricated it as an excuse to get her son to come visit her. Michael was annoyed at being tricked, but played along to avoid conflict. For the rest of the trip, I kept my distance from both James and Michael. On the way back, James tried to put his hand on my knee again. I gently removed it and told him that we had made a mistake and could not continue sneaking around behind our spouse's backs. He reluctantly agreed. Over the next few months, I seriously considered whether I wanted to stay married. Michael was as emotionally detached as he had ever been, and we lacked real intimacy. I decided to ask him to go to counseling with me. To my surprise, he agreed. With some hard emotional work, we were able to rebuild connection and trust. I maintained boundaries with his parents and did not allow them to interfere excessively in our lives. Although there are still issues in our marriage, we are in a happier place now. I haven't spoken to James since our trip, though I still sometimes remember that night of weakness. But in the end, I am glad I decided to rededicate myself to my marriage. Story number three. Hi, I'm glad to see you on my channel. 
Show your support by liking, subscribing, and leaving comments. Something unexpected happened to me one day. My name is Brenda, and I am 40 years old. My husband, Mark, is 30 years old. Throughout our relationship, we constantly faced criticism and judgment because of our age difference, which I really resented. You see, I was his lecturer at university when he was already getting his master's degree and taught him physics. As soon as I met him, I was immediately attracted to his determination as a student. He was always diligent in completing assignments and attending all lectures. He was not just an average guy, but rather an outstanding personality. I fell in love with him instantly, but for ethical reasons, we could not be together at that time. So I waited patiently for him to graduate from university. I knew he had feelings for me too, because he even asked me out a few times. However, I declined his offers and put off romance until the right time came when we were free to continue our relationship. When he graduated from university, I finally agreed to go on a date with him. It was great. It was a bit unusual to go from being a teacher to being a girl, but our relationship started to grow rapidly. We got married. I met his parents. His mother accepted me right away. His father was unapproachable. He was ex-military, always serious, and never smiled, but he was so damn attractive for his age. One day, Mark asked me to go to his parents' house to pick up some delicious food. He really loved his mom's booze. I tried to learn how to make it to please him, but I just couldn't do it. And here I am on the road, tired after work, going to get a cake. I was lucky to have a car, or I would not have taken the bus. I walk to the house. I ring the doorbell, expecting that my husband's mom will open the door, hand me the cake, and I will go home. But then I was greeted by Mark's father out of the blue. He was home alone. His wife was not at home. It was unusual for me, but he greeted me with a smile. I thought, well, there must be something wrong. He smelled of alcohol and offered to come in, which was unusual. I sat down on the couch. He brought two glasses and wine, put them on the table and said, will you keep me company? Well, was I a fool to refuse, to get close to my father-in-law? We started drinking, laughing loudly and talking, absolutely on different topics. I saw a different side of him. He didn't seem like stale bread to me now, but a soft, freshly baked bun. He sat down close to me, put his arm around me, and then a strong feeling flared up that I couldn't get rid of. It happened quickly and without any turn right and then left. That's what a real man is all about, taking matters into his own hands. We talked for a long time afterwards and it turned out that he liked me for a long time, but he never wanted to show it. After a long conversation, we smoked together on the balcony. A cold breeze was blowing around us. I began to realize that's what happiness means. As Mark's father and I smoked a cigarette each on the balcony, I was struck by how natural it felt to be around this man. Over the years, I had grown accustomed to thinking of him as stern and aloof, but when he was alone with me, his harsh temperament melted away, replaced by an easy warmth and magnetism I couldn't resist. When he pulled me into his strong embrace, I eagerly surrendered to his love, feeling the hard muscles beneath his shirt. When his large hand propped my chin up, I looked into his green eyes hopefully. You deserve better than that, my son, he murmured before sinking a kiss into my lips. I eagerly responded to him, the attraction suppressed for months spilling out. Mark had always felt like a boy in my arms, no matter his age, but his father was the real man. We stepped inside and our clothes fell off of us in quick succession. When he did, I cried out in shock and delight. My father-in-law was an attentive, skillful lover, not at all like the clumsy Mark. He played my body like a well-tuned instrument. He squeezed me like orange juice. I left a few hours later, limping slightly, but with a satisfied face. The secret rendezvous with my husband's father had awakened something primal and intoxicating in him. I knew it would not be our last secret rendezvous. Since then, 
We've had games at every opportunity in his car on my lunch break, and once even in the closet at a family dinner when there was no suspicion. The thrill of forbidden passion under everyone's nose was a drug I couldn't refuse. My father-in-law fulfilled needs I never knew I had, and I discovered facets of femininity I never knew I had. We found our perfect match and society be damned. As long as we're careful, this romance will never end. Story number four. Lennon strolled leisurely through the kitchen. Well, Annabeth, I guess we're alone now. The look in his eyes made me uncomfortable. The way a cat looks when it's just had a taste of sour cream. Don't worry, I'm not some animal. I won't force you to do anything. I just know you and my son don't get along. Ever since Michael got into debt and we had to move in with my in-laws, things have been strained. We've been fighting more and more. My husband kept saying that his business would get better and we wouldn't have to worry about money anymore. But I began to lose faith in his words. And lately, my father-in-law had started making some not so subtle hints. Understand me, Ivy, my wife is getting old and I want a young one like you. I'll buy you expensive things, jewelry. So there's no cheating with a relative, right? I felt a flush of anger rush over my face. Well, you know, a few centuries ago, there was even such a tradition. On special occasions, the father-in-law would take the place of the husband. In every way. Lennon smirked. In every way. You know what I mean? He headed for the bedroom he shared with his mother-in-law on the second floor. Time passed, but nothing changed. Michael's debts continued to pile up and he began to act strangely. He would leave the room to make phone calls and put a password on his phone that he refused to share with anyone. It was all becoming clear, but until now, I had been in denial, fooling myself. One day, I reached a breaking point. I decided to quietly follow Michael when he said he was going to work. In the back of my mind, I knew there was a chance he wasn't lying, but something inside me was compelling me to follow him. And just as I suspected, my husband headed toward a large gray brick five-story building. He was met at one of the entrances by a lush woman, his youthful friend. I could hardly contain my groan, faced with the choice of confronting them both, screaming and expressing my anger, or silently watching everything that unfolded in front of me. I chose the latter, silently watching their every move. She wrapped her long, slender arms around his shoulders, and in response, Michael kissed her as hotly as he had never kissed me since our wedding day. At that moment, I couldn't take it anymore. I drove away quickly, pushing the gas pedal as hard as I could. I made the final decision to leave quietly, without saying a word to anyone. I returned to our apartment, where only my father-in-law was. Oh, my beloved, your eyes are full of tears, he exclaimed, stepping toward me and hugging me gently. What's wrong? I could no longer contain my emotions. Your son is a cheater. I choked on my words and tears streamed down my face. Calm down, he soothed me, repeating those words over and over. Here, have a drink. He handed me a glass. I took a sip of the murky liquid he offered me and immediately felt a wave of drowsiness wash over me. My father-in-law stepped closer and pulled me to him for another hug. I can't even explain what happened next. Whether it was my attempt to get back at my husband or whether I was under the influence of the drink, I began to respond to my father-in-law's advances, even though every fiber of my being was telling me to stop. I came back to reality when someone entered the apartment. It turned out that somehow we'd already made it to my father-in-law's bedroom and we'd been interrupted at the worst possible moment. Michael walked in and chaos ensued. There was yelling, threats to tell my mother-in-law. And I sat there feeling lost and broken, not knowing why I had allowed myself to do such a thing. It's all in the past now, I reassured myself. I live in another city and I have a new life. As for my father-in-law, he still sometimes writes love letters, which I delete unread. I know now 
that he was an unscrupulous predator who took advantage of his superiority, no matter how agreeable I was at the time. I only blame myself for the choices I made, but I blame him for provoking me when I was defenseless. Story number five. Little did I know that after a long day at work, I would find myself engaged in a conversation with my father-in-law. My wife and I had recently got married and were temporarily living with her parents. So far, our two years of marriage had been a happy one. Patricia's parents were ordinary people, her father worked in a factory, and her mother was an accountant in a firm. When I entered the house, my father-in-law greeted me and said he wanted to have a serious talk, man to man. We settled down in the kitchen and he brought out a bottle of whiskey. We had a few drinks each, discussing work, family, and other topics. However, I couldn't understand what this serious conversation was about. Eventually, he looked at me and said, Stephen, I have a lot to share with you, man to man. I appreciate you, trust you, and believe that everything that is said here will stay between us. I have been having an affair with another woman. For the past five months, I have been visiting her periodically. I spend an hour or two with her during the day, and in the evening, I tell my wife that I am away on business at the factory. However, my wife constantly calls me and interrupts our time together. To avoid suspicion, I need to keep her busy so that she does not notice my absence. The only solution I can think of is to involve you. It's a win-win for both of us. My wife won't suspect a thing, and you'll have something to keep you busy. Not that I'm angry or jealous, but I've noticed you look at her as more than just a mother-in-law. So you're willing to spend time with her while I'm away? I paused, searching for the right words. Yes, that's exactly what he suggested. You got that right. Don't worry, I won't make any demands and I'll support you. She'll be delighted because she's an attractive woman, despite her 50 years. In my 55, I can't satisfy her desires and desire for a mistress. You don't have to come up with anything complicated. Just find a moment when she's in the shower and surprise her by going in there, maybe even naked. I haven't decided yet. Just come up with something. Hopefully, when the time comes, you'll be there for her and do it right. Judging by the screams coming from your bedroom at night, it sounds like you know what to do. Trust me, once you start, she won't be able to resist. Try it tomorrow. I won't be home from 5, 0 to 7, 0 p.m. She usually gets home from work at 4, 30. Hopefully, two hours will be enough time for the first time. To be honest, I was up most of the night. First of all, I pondered what my father-in-law had said. He always seemed to be the paragon of marital fidelity. Second, my mother-in-law kept occupying my thoughts. How do I start? What should I do? I must not offend her, and I must present myself in the best possible way. What should I call her afterwards? Helen? I actually liked her, and my father-in-law was right. I often admired her. I've never been with an older woman before. I'm 28 and she's 50. She's not overweight, but she's not thin. She's got a good figure. A tantalizing woman. I didn't have any particular thoughts and fell asleep by morning. The next day, I arrived home from work at five o'clock in the evening. To my surprise, my mother-in-law was already there with a towel wrapped around her head, indicating that she had just finished showering. She was wearing a robe and greeted me warmly. She mentioned that dinner was cooking on the stove and headed into the bathroom to do the laundry. Curiosity got the best of me and I peeked into the bathroom and saw her leaning over the tub, washing something. At that moment, I thought it was the perfect opportunity to make a move since due to the circumstances she wouldn't resist. I quickly undressed and quietly entered the bathroom, approaching her from behind. After considering the consequences, I gathered my courage and got down to business. Surprisingly, there was no outrage. The mother-in-law didn't seem to immediately realize what had happened, so I continued on. Eventually, we moved to the bedroom where our acquaintance continued. Our first intimacy lasted about half an hour. Thank you for the pleasure, she said. Honestly, 
I didn't expect this from you, but I'm pleasantly surprised and pleased with what happened. I've missed having a husband for the past six months, and I think I found a good life partner in you. She sat down on my bed and kissed me. After that first hot encounter with my mother-in-law, I was tormented by guilt. No matter how much my body enjoyed it, my conscience screamed that I had betrayed my wife and her trust. For the next few days, I awkwardly avoided being alone with Helen, but I could feel her eyes on me, full of hunger and anticipation for round two. Soon, my father-in-law cornered me, wanting to know how things were going with Helen. He greeted me, at which point I reluctantly admitted that we'd had intimacy and immediately began to pry for details. I shuddered at his curiosity about me sleeping with his wife. It didn't take long for Helen to tolerate my evasiveness. One afternoon, she showed up at my workplace wearing a raincoat with almost nothing underneath. Before I could object, she led me into the storeroom and what all guys want to do when they're left in that situation happened. Our forbidden tryst continued for months. That encounter was incredible. I knew that if my wife ever found out, it would destroy our marriage. Finally, the guilt became too much. I told Helen that we had to end it for good. Grief-stricken, she tried desperately to change my mind, but to no avail. My father-in-law was furious when he found out I'd been in love with her, wanted to stop distracting his wife, but I insisted on my own and decided to stop these adventures. To be honest, I myself am already tired of it all. We'll see what happens next. Story number six. As I stare out the tiny oval window, watching the distant land, my heart races with anxiety and excitement. I'm flying to a city I've never visited before, and I'm about to plunge into the unfamiliar lives of relatives I barely know. Just a month ago, I was Helen, a small town art teacher, modest but content in her tiny studio apartment filled with half-finished canvases. Then I met Xavier, an up-and-coming executive who inexplicably fell in love with me, buying one of my amateur paintings on a whim. Before I realized what was happening, he proposed and whisked me away to a new life of luxury as his wife. Our courtship was a dizzying succession of lavish get-togethers, champagne toasts in his penthouse overlooking the glittering cityscape, and conversations that dragged on until dawn. The love in the post was passionate. Xavier was an attentive and generous lover. Taking me in his arms, he looked at me with warm brown eyes and whispered how incredibly lucky he was to have found me. It was everything I'd never even dared to dream of in my life. So when he begged me to visit his parents to help care for his mother who was very ill, I couldn't say no. To this day, my heart still pounds with excitement as the plane descends toward the unfamiliar city where Xavier's family, now my family, awaits my arrival. I desperately hope I can care for his mother and please his father, Albert. I must convince them that I am worthy of their only son despite our crazy marriage. The airplane lowers to the tarmac and rolls up to the gate. I stroke my sundress with my hands and take a deep breath, gaining strength. Soon, I'm making my way through the busy terminal to the arrivals hall. My gaze scans the crowd until I spot him Albert. Xavier looks a lot like his father, the same strong jaw, intense gaze, confident posture, but Albert's salt and peach hair and weathered face give him an appeal that surpasses his son's boyish charm. My breath catches when our gazes meet. You must be Helen, he says, squeezing my hand. His grip is warm, firm, welcome. We walk across the parking lot to his luxury SUV. As we drive to his luxurious home, the conversation between us flows easily. Albert asks thoughtful questions about my painting and offers encouraging words about making a name for himself in his city's vibrant art scene. When we pull up to the house, he gives me a brief tour and then shows me the luxurious guest bedroom where I will be staying. I notice that he keeps his eyes on my body in the light sundress. Although I've gotten used to men's admiring gazes since I married Xavier, the sight of my father-in-law makes my pulse quicken. At dinner that night, the atmosphere becomes increasingly tense. 
Albert's lingering glances become overtly seductive. It's wrong, I say to myself, because he's my husband's father. And yet I catch myself shamelessly responding to his flirtations. Later, as I lie awake, a restless desire flares up in me. It's dangerous. Albert is above suspicion. But I'm thousands of miles away from home and Xavier, alone and vulnerable in this luxurious mansion with my handsome father-in-law, who knows how to charm a woman. I clench my thighs tightly, feeling the familiar ache of longing. Somehow, I know I won't be able to stop what's simmering between Albert and me. And as terrified as I am of my own lust, I feel as horny as I've ever felt in my young life. Tomorrow this game will begin in earnest, swearing at propriety. And so help me God, I won't be able to resist seeing where it leads. Morning sunlight streams into my luxurious guest bedroom. I stretch lazily before the memories of last night and my fantasies come flooding back at me with renewed vigor. Albert's sly gaze that undressed me as effectively as if he'd used his hands, my panting flirtation, the charged air that hung between us. Desire still simmers in my soul, despite the guilt. This man is my husband's father. And yet the attraction is undeniable, this electric chemistry too strong to resist exploring. I stand up and put on a revealing sundress preparing myself for this dangerous game. Albert sits at the massive dining room table and looks through the newspaper. He slowly lowers the paper as I enter and his burning eyes trace every inch of my body. Good morning, Helen. I hope you slept well. His tone is casual, but an inviting smile plays on his lips. We make idle, casual conversation during breakfast, but the words seem trifling, our intense gazes conveying everything. When I accidentally drop my napkin and drop my gaze to Albert's bare thighs to pick it up, his nostrils flare almost imperceptibly. I hide a smirk, pleased that I can bewitch this formidable man. When we finish eating, Albert invites me to take a tour of the expansive mansion with him. In the master bedroom, he shows off Marie's enormous walk-in closet, and I look at her elegant dresses, imagining the lavish parties once thrown in this house. Turning to Albert, I see that he's staring hungrily at me. In two quick steps, he closes the space between us, pinning me against the closet wall. One large hand wraps around my throat, and he roughly tilts my chin upward. If you want me to stop, just say so, he growls. I know I should run, but defiance and entirus makes me stand still. Let him make the first move. In response to my silence, his mouth presses against mine, the kiss strong and long and filled with years of suppressed longing. My hands slide down his broad chest and clutch his silver hair tightly. We engulf each other until we're both panting. In one smooth motion, Albert easily lifts me up and carries me to the bed and lays me on it, pulling me against him with his solid weight. We stare at each other greedily, my heart pounding frantically. Tell me you want this, Helen. Yes, Albert, yes, I whimper. That's all the encouragement he needs before his big hands start doing their work. Finally, there are no barriers between us. The world fades away from what's happening. His expert touch ignites parts of my body that I didn't even know existed until now. He masterfully plays with my body. Any lingering feelings of guilt towards my husband fade away, only Albert remains. When we both finally tip over the edge, the force of my climax blinds my vision for a moment. As I sink back into my body, Albert collapses beside me, breathing heavily, and his earlier restraint is replaced by satisfaction with his eyes closed. That was. This time the words don't help the menacing man. I know, I reply quietly. We exchange smiles full of new secrets. What we've just discovered can never be taken back. The thought is terrifying and intoxicating. The world will never look the same again. I slowly wake up, forgetting for a moment where I am. Memories of the past few days spent in Albert's strong, friendly embrace came flooding back to me. My return to the guest bedroom just before dawn 
to get a couple hours of sleep before reprising my role as the caring daughter-in-law when Avier called. The tumultuous secret affair with my father-in-law has become my exciting new double life. As I dress and prepare for another day of adventure, my reflection stares back at me from the ornate mirror. Flushed cheeks, lips swollen from kissing, a glint in my eyes that wasn't there before. Under Albert's experienced hands, I am transformed into a sensual, desirable woman I never knew existed. The shy art teacher is gone, replaced by a confident temptress. I catch Albert with a cup of coffee at the kitchen island, studying papers. He lifts his head, a spark flashing in his eyes as he circles my curves in the tight sundress. Good morning, beautiful, he purrs. Unable to resist, I move to him from behind, wrapping my arms around the hard planes of his chest. He makes a sound like a throaty growl that makes me shiver. Savior called earlier. He said hi, Albert remarks casually, though his body betrays tension. I freeze for a moment. My husband's blinding reality is like a downpour of ice water that brings me back to sanity. What am I doing? Sensing my sudden guilt, Albert turns to face me. Change your mind? He takes me by the chin. Do you want to be Marie again to lead a safe, passionless existence again? His words throw me back from the brink, awakening the defiance in me. Take me back to the bedroom, Albert, I whisper recklessly. He obeys with a rascally grin. Soon, Xavier and everything else disappears, and Albert and I are plunged back into our not usual adventure. In the days that follow, we have established an unspoken routine. Mornings filled with provocative glances at breakfast, Albert's hot hands constantly finding ways to drag me into the spare rooms. In the evenings, I've lounged in his arms, lazily chatting, and our connection has grown deeper. We talk about art, books, dreams, never about the outside world. Sometimes guilt gnaws at me. When Xavier calls, Albert watches me intently while I make light small talk with my oblivious husband. I must confess and destroy Xavier's peace, his family. Albert seems to read my mind, constantly bringing me back from the brink with intoxicating kisses until I forget my own name. Sometimes at the mention of Xavier, a dark jealousy flashes in Albert's eyes. I assure Albert that he owns my soul, and yet a tiny doubt remains. Can Albert ever fully share me? For now, our private bliss is uninterrupted as Marie sleeps a serene sleep in the hospital. But I know that this dazzling dream of both men's devotion cannot last forever. I'm balancing on the tightrope between them, expecting I'm about to fall but I will enjoy these warm days and nights while they last. I slipped silently back into the darkened guest room, my heart still racing. I had just left Albert's room after hours of passionate adventure, both of us insatiable for each other. As I reached up to turn on the bedside lamp, a harsh voice pierced the shadows. Where have you been? I gasp and turn around and see Xavier staring at me from the chair in the corner his handsome face contorted with rage. He leaps to his feet and crosses the room in two strides, grabbing me roughly by the shoulders. I asked you a question. Why are you sneaking in here at five in the morning wearing my father's shirt? He shakes me awake as realization hits him. You're sleeping with him, aren't you? With my own father. I deny helplessly, but the pure truth is written all over my face. The expression on Xavier's face changes from anger to anguish. He abruptly lets go of me and turns away with a guttural cry of despair. My heart is torn apart when I see the man I love in such agony. I realize that our marriage will never recover from this ultimate betrayal. Xavier, please. I hesitantly reach for him, but he jerks back to meet my gaze. How could you do this to me? To me? To our family? His voice trails off half-heartedly. Seeing his pain, I unleash my own raging emotions. You left me alone with him. I exclaim accusingly. You barely know me, and already you've thrown me into this den of temptation. 
I gesture wildly around the luxurious mansion. Xavier stares at me. Are you really implying that this is my fault? His indignation flares with renewed vigor. I tried to resist him. I insist desperately. But we have this. Deep connection. He understands parts of me that you've never been interested in. Xavier flinches as if I've slapped him. That connection is called meanness, Helen, he hissed venomously. I thought what we had was love. Now I realize I was only a stepping stone in your social ascent, into my own family. His cruel words spur my fervor. How dare you? If you really loved me, you would know who I really am. Hot tears flow down my cheeks. There is a tense silence between us, rage in the air. I realize with a sinking heart that this is all too bad. For all the passion between us, by giving in to selfish desire, Albert and I have broken something that cannot be repaired. The bedroom door creaks open. We turn around in unison to see Albert's enormous silhouette. Xavier makes a strangled sound of rage in his throat. Get out of my house, he snaps at his father. Albert's eyes cross over to me without reading. Without a word, he turns and walks away. The soft click of the front door closing completes the death knell of my shattered marriage. Xavier's devastated eyes meet mine one last time. I wish I had never met you, he whispers. Those words hurt my heart. He pushes past me and I fall to the floor, choking back sobs. I have everything I wanted passion, prestige, luxurious comfort. But I see now that the price was too high. I'd give back the last month if I could. My bargain with the devil has ruined my life, and my soul is empty. I am truly cursed. Story number seven. Marina raised Sarah alone, and the girl grew up easily trusting people and a little naive. It was not difficult to gain her trust. When Sarah was 23 years old, Marina introduced a stepfather into their lives. Unfortunately, the man disliked Sarah from the very beginning. He was arrogant and always wanted to prove his superiority. Sarah disliked him. Despite this, she tried to avoid him as much as possible. She focused on her studies, attending the institute, and even enrolled in a 3D drawing course. She even considered enrolling in a guitar playing school just to keep herself busy. However, her stepfather strongly rejected the idea due to her lack of hearing. One day, Sarah became seriously ill and she had to be treated for almost a month. Marina was busy with work and could not take care of her daughter. By coincidence, her stepfather was on vacation and had a lot of free time. During this period, Sarah was able to see him from a different side. While her mother was away from home, he took attentive care of her. He even offered to drive her to and from the clinic for physical therapy sessions. Sarah hadn't experienced such unconditional care in a long time. Her mother worked all the time, and Sarah was used to taking care of herself. The warmth and care shown by her stepfather melted her heart. As Sarah recovered, her perception of her stepfather changed. They began to have breakfast as a family, and on weekends they went out of town or shopping together. At first, Marina was happy about these positive changes, but then she began to notice something suspicious. Sarah smiled at her stepfather in a special way and he did not mind smiling back. Sarah, who used to be aggressive towards him, became a completely different person in his presence. Marina's intuition did not fail her. One evening, she came home from work earlier than usual. What she saw there shocked her, her daughter with her stepfather in the bedroom, to such a sight she was not ready. Overwhelmed with strong emotions, Marina began to shout at him and demanded that he leave. The daughter quickly realized that she needed to make a scene to create the impression that her stepfather compromised her. After all, if she confessed her feelings to her mother, then, in her opinion, the latter will despise her. Marina gathered Michael's things and threw him out into the street. Although she felt sad to be alone again, she could not accept his betrayal. Daughter Sarah supported her mother and hid her feelings for the man. However, 
Sarah was deeply in love and could no longer contain her emotions. She urgently needed to confide in someone. After calming her mother and promising to return soon, Sarah left home. She sought comfort from her classmate Emily. Sarah and Emily had long been close friends, and Sarah trusted her completely. With tears in her eyes, Sarah stood on the doorstep, unable to enter. Emily opened the door with surprise on her face and exclaimed, Why are you knocking like that? Come in already. Sarah burst into tears, feeling the ground go from under her feet. In a trembling voice, she narrated the events that had taken place. You know how I despised him at first, but then suddenly fell in love. My friend couldn't believe what she heard. Thinking he was already old and you had already managed to fall in love with him, we weren't even close at that point. My mom caught us at the worst possible moment, just exchanging pleasantries and kissing. Emily was struck by her friend's innocence and remarked, thank God you didn't make any mistakes. He's just taking advantage of you. Emily assumed that since Marina was constantly busy with work, he was just looking for a woman's affection and decided to take advantage of the situation. However, Sarah assured her friend that he wasn't like that and that Michael was a decent man. Emily promised to keep everything she learned that night a secret, although she couldn't understand what her friend found in this man. There were plenty of attractive guys her age around. Now it became difficult for the lovers to find more time to spend together. Since Sarah had a boyfriend, it was important for her to introduce him to her mother. But how to explain her love for her stepfather, even if he is her mother's ex, lover? So the girl asked Emily to cover for her sometimes and pretend that her friend was visiting her. This was not difficult for Emily since she is single and lives alone. This allowed Sarah to spend more time with Michael. All would have been fine if it weren't for the woman's jealousy. Besides, Emily herself did not have the best relationships with guys. Like any girl, she too longed for a love as pure as Sarah and Michael's. They seemed so happy together and envy began to take over Emily. She began to think of ways to separate the sweet couple, convinced that Michael was no match for Sarah. The lovers often argued about where to go and how to spend their time because of the significant age difference. Michael, being a busy doctor, was constantly tired, while Sarah, being a student, led a privileged lifestyle. She even sacrificed her studies to spend more time with him, which also bothered Emily. One day, Sarah's mother visited Emily's house. Marina happened to be passing by and decided to ask her best friend why her daughter was having difficulty in her studies. After all, it was the last year of school and it was impossible to fall behind. Emily hesitated for a long time, torn between her conscience and her desire to help Sarah avoid mistakes and overcome her envy of other people's happiness. Finally, she gave in and mentioned that she had a mature partner. Mole doesn't know who exactly, but she doesn't like that her friend has fallen under a negative influence. Mom was shocked. It seemed unreal and impossible. Emily, did you see him? I just happened to see them together from the back. She couldn't give any more details. In Marina's mind, doubts were growing rapidly. Then an idea struck her. Not long ago, Marina had met with a local police officer. He even expressed interest in going out with her. However, she asked him to wait. Now, she would have to approach him herself. Scrunching up her nose, Marina thought to herself, she dialed the number of the district police officer and asked for a meeting. During dinner, they decided to spend time in a small, cozy cafe. The policeman behaved rather insistently, but Marina preferred to ignore his advances. However, when there was no more patience, she gathered courage and said, Peter, I would like to ask you something about my daughter. I believe she needs my help. A policeman has offered to help her with a private investigation, but in return he has asked that she meet with him again, perhaps in the same cab. Marina reluctantly agreed. A few days later, Peter learned the identity of the man Sarah was meeting with and gave his name to Marina. She was at a loss for words. Are you serious? Is this really my ex? There was no doubt about it. 
The policeman was a professional at his job. Promising a second date, Marita hurried home. A storm was brewing in the house. Sarah was just at home, and her mother, as best she could, told her everything. So you've been doing this for a long time. It's so disgusting. Oh my God. Oh my God. Sarah was crying, begging me to understand. I love him, and he loves me. You don't understand anything, Mom. Marina held a grudge against her daughter for a long time, all the while shedding tears, convinced that Michael was taking advantage of the naive girl. Marina was torn. She advised her daughter not to hurry with marriage until she finished her studies at the university. The exams were approaching, the girl's grades were falling. Sarah vowed that her mother would be proud of her daughter and that she would graduate with honors. She felt guilty for stealing her lover and worried about her mother's pain. However, her love for her mother motivated her to keep her promise. Sarah passed her exams and received her diploma. Everything fell into place. Marina found a new love. It was the same policeman named Peter, and they started a relationship. She left her resentment towards her daughter and forgave them both. The sweet couple went their separate ways. Her ex was not ready for a serious commitment, and having children was not in his plans. Sarah was wrong about Michael. He turned out to be a typical bad boy. A few months later, when Sarah had recovered from her former stepfather's betrayal, she met a guy two years older than herself, and they were soon married. They were expecting a boy, which they found out about on an ultrasound. 